Sorry, I had a technical glitch there, which terminated the video file. And so I'm starting a new file. So lecture three is going to be split into two MP4s, which I'm going to call lecture 3A and lecture 3B. This is the beginning of lecture 3B. I'll pick it up where we left off before. So we were talking about measurement in the scenario where we have an apparatus and a system. There's a unitary interaction between apparatus and system followed by an orthogonal measurement on the apparatus. And so the form of the unitary interaction that I'm going to want to consider between the system and the apparatus is uh, shown here. Um, I've expanded it in terms of the orthogonal projectors acting on the system. Those are the measurement outcomes on the system that I want to consider. And for each measurement outcome on the system, an orthogonal projector, on the apparatus, there's a, what I'll call a shift operator. Now this is summed over B. So for each basis state for the apparatus, what this operator does is it shifts the basis state by the amount A, which labels this projector. So you should think of this as being addition modulo D, if there are D possible measurement outcomes, the apparatus system as dimension D, we could label the basis states by 0, 1, 2, et cetera, up to D minus 1. And by addition modulo D, I mean if we shift by 1, for example, uh, then 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, et cetera, 0 goes to 1. D minus 1 goes to 0. So you can think of the D outcomes as being arranged like points on a circle which are cyclically identified. So this um, shift should really be think, thought of as a shift on a circle. And it's kind of obvious that this is unitary, meaning it um, preserves inner products, but let's, let's check it explicitly uh, by evaluating the product of U and U adjoint. So here I've just written U again, expanded as before. And here's its adjoint. I don't have to do anything to the projector because it's Hermitian, the adjoint doesn't do anything. Uh, but in the shift operator, which uh, that part isn't Hermitian, so the bras and cats change places here. And now I want to evaluate the product. So we have an inner product of basis state B for the apparatus with a basis state D so that will uh, require B to be equal to D. And acting on the system, we have a product of two projectors, E sub A and E sub C, that will require that A equal to C. So the sum is going to collapse to just a sum over A and B, where for the product of E A, E C, I can write E A. And then for the ket B plus A, bra D plus C, uh, that becomes the projection onto basis state B plus A. But for each value of A, when I sum over all the values of B, I'm summing over projectors onto all of the basis states. So that's just the identity operator acting on the apparatus. And then I have the sum over A of the EAs. And because of the completeness and the measurement operators, that's just the identity on the system. So we see U, U adjoint, is equal to the identity operator. This is a unitary operator. And the way we're going to use it is we're going to initialize our apparatus for some particular basis state, let's say the zero state. And then after the interaction, we're going to perform an orthogonal measurement in that basis on the apparatus. So if we have some input state psi of the system, which is what we're going to want to measure, after this unitary interaction, we have this entangled state of the system and the apparatus. For each basis state A of the apparatus, the input state is acted on by EA, because when EA acts, the apparatus gets shifted from zero to A. 
And now we envision Bob or someone measuring the apparatus uh, in the, this orthogonal basis. So that means uh, each one of Bob's measurement outcomes, assuming it's Bob doing the measurement, each one of our measurements on the apparatus is projecting onto one of these basis states for the apparatus, but it's not doing anything to the system. And so when we let that operator act on this state for some particular outcome A, it's just going to uh, project it down to EA acting on the system tensored with A for um, the apparatus. And the probability of that outcome will just be the norm squared of that state. And that's just the norm squared of system projector EA acting on the input system state. So you see what we've wound up doing is realizing an orthogonal measurement obeying the same axioms we discussed for closed systems acting on the system, but we realize that measurement by leveraging our ability to measure the apparatus without assuming a priori we could measure the system, though we did assume that we could do some controlled interaction between the system and the apparatus to create this correlated state. But now we can ask the question, what if we measured the apparatus in a different orthogonal basis? You see, the form that I've written here is actually the Schmidt form of an entangled state for the system and the apparatus. Because the basis states A are a north normal basis, but furthermore, the EA psi's are mutually orthogonal, okay, because these are orthogonal projectors. And then I've performed a measurement of the apparatus in that. Schmidt basis, and that's how I, in effect, projected out the result of applying EA to the system. But there's no law that says that's the basis in which I have to do the measurement. I could measure the apparatus after the unitary interaction in any orthogonal basis I want. So as an example, let's suppose we just have two qubits, a system qubit and an apparatus qubit. We might uh, just to have something concrete to think about. Imagine that we're measuring the spin of an electron. Uh, we do a stern gerlach type experiment and it gets deflected either up or down in a homogeneous magnetic field. So it moves to one of two positions and we're going to measure that position of the electron to determine the outcome of measurement of its spin. But suppose we do something sneaky. We don't measure in the position it got deflected up or deflected down corresponding to state zero and one of the apparatus, but instead we measure in a different basis. See the state that we get is this entangled state. Uh, if the input state of the system is alpha zero plus beta one of uh, the entangled state of system and apparatus is alpha zero zero plus beta one one. And then when we measure the apparatus in the zero one basis, we're projecting out either zero for the system or one for the system with probabilities which are given by absolute value of alpha squared or absolute value of beta squared respectively. But by some magic, maybe by using a beam splitter or something, we measure in a different basis, not the basis zero and one of the apparatus, but the basis zero plus one, a state I'm calling plus or zero minus one, a state I'm calling minus. Maybe I put the uh, traveling electron in an interferometer or something like that so that I can measure in that basis. However, I do it to find the post measurement state, I should take this entangled state of system and apparatus and ask what the result is of applying the corresponding bra to the state to get a post measurement state for uh, the system. And now uh, that state up to normalization is just going to be, in the case of the plus one outcome for this measurement of the apparatus, alpha zero plus beta one for the system, the same as the input state. Or if I got the outcome minus zero minus one, then apart from possible normalization, the post measurement state is going to be alpha zero minus beta one. And those two states are not necessarily orthogonal. In fact, they're orthogonal only if um, alpha or beta is um, equal to um, 
equal to zero. Um, and then find the probabilities for those outcomes. I just take the result of applying the broad to the state and take its absolute value squared because those are our rules for assigning probabilities to orthogonal measurements. And because we have, since uh, we knew to normalize uh, the state plus or minus the one over square root of two, which gets squared, that means we're going to have one half uh, the norm of alpha zero plus beta one, um, the norm squared for the probability in the case of the plus outcome, and the norm squared of alpha zero minus beta one, the probability for the minus outcome times one half. And those two probabilities are the same for alpha zero plus beta one and alpha zero minus beta one, the norm squared is absolute value of alpha squared plus absolute value of beta squared, namely one. So the two outcomes both have probability one half. And the two post-measurement states are not mutually orthogonal. And so in this case, if we were to repeat the measurement again immediately after, we wouldn't get the same outcome. Um, if we get the plus one outcome, the state becomes, uh, well, the same as it was initially, alpha zero plus beta one. If we get the minus outcome, it becomes alpha zero minus beta one. Then we measure again, the two outcomes are still going to have probability one half, whatever they were the first time. Okay, so this is really a different type of measurement than we've discussed before. It doesn't have the probability, the property that if you immediately repeat the measurement, you're going to get the same outcome with probability one. So now I'd just like to look at this a little more generally. Now I'm gonna speak of generalized measurements. So now there are two systems and now I'm gonna go back to calling them Alice and Bob instead of system and apparatus. Well, sometimes I'll say system and apparatus, but now I want to imagine that there's a world that consists of Alice's system and Bob's system. Alice can only observe system A and Bob can do whatever he wants to system B. And so there's going to be some initial state of Alice's system, which is not correlated at all with Bob's system. And then some unitary interaction is going to occur, which will entangle A and B. And then Bob is going to do, do an orthogonal measurement on system B and report to Alice the outcome that he obtained. And what we'd like to know is what probabilities should we assign to those outcomes? And what is Alice's post-measurement state for each possible outcome? So now A and B are just any finite dimensional systems. Uh, we start out, let's say, with a pure state for system A, um, and we set system B to a standard basis state, I'll call it zero. And then there's some unitary interaction between the two that maps the joint state of A and B to a new state, which I'm gonna call psi prime, oops, to a new state psi prime. And I can take that resulting state and I can expand it in any basis I want for Bob's system. But let's use the basis in which Bob is going to do his orthogonal measurement. I can use any basis I want and that's a convenient one to use. So for each of the possible basis states that uh, we might have for Bob, there will be some corresponding uh, linear operator acting on Alice's input with which it's correlated. And then we have to sum over all the possible basis states for Bob to represent this state psi prime, the joint state of A and B after the unitary interaction. But this is a unitary operator, and that means that it has to preserve inner products. So let's check what that implies about these operators and mu acting on Alice's system. I should have for any input state psi for Alice's uh, system, the Output state psi prime AB had better be normalized because the input state was. So let's evaluate its norm squared. I take the inner product of the state with itself. Um, so I'm summing over two indices now, one for the state psi prime AB, another summation for the corresponding bra uh, psi prime. And now I have to evaluate this inner product, but I know that Bob's basis states labeled by mu are orthonormal. So we'll get a non-zero contribution only when mu is equal to nu. That collapses this to a single sum. And so what I have is the sum over mu, that index which labels Bob's basis states and therefore his measurement outcomes, the expectation value in the state psi, Alice's input state, 
of mu adjoint mu summed over all the outcomes. And we know that this has to be equal to one for any possible input state for Alice. And the only way that's possible is if the sum of mu adjoint mu is equal to the identity as an operator equation. Okay, so just from the fact that u is unitary, it must be the case that the sum over mu of mu adjoint mu is equal to the identity acting on Alice's system. So now we imagine Bob does his orthogonal measurement. So his measurement operators, his projectors, will all have the form of identity on Alice's system because he doesn't touch that, but he projects his own system onto uh, the basis state mu. And then to find the probability of a particular outcome, we take the result according to our measurement axiom for closed systems of applying e mu to the state right before the measurement, which is the state side prime after the unitary interaction has occurred, and we take its norm squared. And when we um, get a particular outcome, remember we're just going to get the state m mu acting on Alice's initial state psi. So it's norm squared is just the norm squared of m mu applied to psi. And what's the post measurement state? Well, it's just the result of applying e mu uh, to the input state psi prime. Remember that projects Bob's system onto a particular basis state mu and it applies m mu to Alice's input. And then we have to normalize it to make sure we get a normalized state. And now we could imagine that we immediately perform the same measurement again by the same method. So what will be the probability if we got the outcome mu the first time of getting the outcome nu in the second measurement? The conditional probability of nu in the second measurement given the outcome mu in the first measurement. So I take the post measurement state from the first measurement and then um, I apply m nu, the measurement out operator corresponding to the second measurement outcome to that post measurement state and I take its absolute value squared and so that is this expression in the numerator I have a new mu absolute value squared uh, and, and new mu applied to psi absolute value squared divided by the um, norm squared of mu applied to Alice's initial state. So the only way that will be guaranteed for any input from Alice that we get the same outcome the second time is if when we apply m nu after applying m mu uh, that gives zero when mu is not equal to nu and when mu is equal to nu up to a possible phase factor it just gives me m mu back. So that's essentially an orthogonal measurement and for anything other than an orthogonal measurement on Alice's system that is if Bob um, performs uh, his measurement in some uh, general basis, uh, we won't have the repeatability property that we found in the case of orthogonal measurements for closed systems. So let's um, take sort of a broader look at what a measurement is. We want a measurement to have the property that there are different outcomes, we can assign probabilities to all the outcomes and um, those probabilities had all better all be non-negative real numbers and they better sum to one. So in general, we should describe a measurement this way, not necessarily assuming it's an orthogonal measurement as we considered before, though I'm still going to use the notation EA uh, that we used before for the measurement outcomes, but now these are not necessarily going to be orthogonal projectors, but they better be Hermitian and they better be non-negative because we want their expectation values if they're to correspond to probabilities of outcomes um, to be non-negative real numbers. And in the case that we just discussed, these measurement operators that determine the probability are just uh, MA adjoint MA, where the MAs are the operators that occurred in the expansion of the state, the joint state of Alice's system and Bob's. So we want the probability, as shown here, to be the expectation value of EA in the input uh, state. Um, in the case where EA is MA adjoint MA, then it is, of course, Hermitian. It is also obviously non negative, because if I take its expectation value, in any state, that's just the norm squared of MA 
acting on a state, and that's certainly greater than or equal to zero. And we also want the sum of the A's to be give, give the identity. And that means that the probabilities are going to sum to one. Um, and of course, that's true in the scenario we just discussed because the sum over A of MA adjoint MA equals identity followed from the unitarity of the interaction between the system and the apparatus. Now that was for the case where Alice's initial state was a pure state. If it's a mixed state, we know we can always think of that as an, some ensemble of pure states. And then the uh, probability of the particular outcome A will just be given by the trace of the density operator before the measurement uh, times EA. Again, those are probabilities. They're non-negative real numbers and they sum to one. Now this type of generalized measurement is sometimes called a positive operator valued measure. Um, that's kind of a fancy word. I'll mostly just call it a generalized measurement. But a generalized measurement, if you like any, um, non-negative operators, a way of choosing non-negative Hermitian operators, uh, which sum to one. And they can be used to define probabilities um, for any input state, any input density operator. And in fact, any such POVM, any such generalized measurement can be realized in the way that I described as a unitary interaction between system and apparatus or if you like between Alice's system and Bob's followed by an orthogonal measurement on Bob's side. Um, well, the reason is that we can always take a square root of the operators uh, defining the POVM and take those to be the operators uh, M sub A in the uh, construction I just described, defining the unitary between Alice's system and Bob's. When we take the square root, there, there's an ambiguity because if I want MA to have the property that MA adjoint MA is equal to EA, uh, that doesn't uniquely define MA. Uh, it defines it up to a unitary operator acting on the left. Um, that is, um, if I consider the square root of MA adjoint MA, and by that I mean the square root with non-negative eigenvalues of the non-negative operator, MA adjoint MA, I could apply a unitary acting from the left. And then if I take MA, MA adjoint MA, that unitary will just, just drop out because UA adjoint UA is equal to the identity. So given the POVM defined by the set of operators EA that have the property of being Hermitian non-negative and complete, uh, the most general way in which I can um, construct a scenario in which that measurement is achieved by first a unitary action in, interaction between system and apparatus followed by orthogonal measurement on the apparatus uh, would give a post measurement state given by MA acting on the input state divided by normalization but in that post measurement state, we have the freedom for each measurement outcome for each value of A to act with a unitary that's conditioned on that outcome. And of course that makes sense because if you do a measurement, you always have the freedom to take the post measurement state and apply a unitary to it because other than, um, other, other than uh, measurements, unitaries are the, the most general things we can do to an isolated system, okay? Now in the case where the input state is mixed, the post measurement state, if we have a particular measurement outcome A, will just be given by MA acting on the input density operator on the right and MA adjoint are acting uh, from the left and MA adjoint acting uh, from the right. Um, and you can see that again, just by expanding rho in terms of pure, pure states. Um, and of course, then we have to normalize it. So it'll have trace one. Now let's consider the following thing. So far, we've been imagining that Alice and Bob have a shared system. Alice can only measure or observe system A. Uh, Bob can do orthogonal measurements on system B. 
the two interact according to some unitary interaction and then Bob measures. But in order for Alice to know the outcome of the measurement, Bob has to tell her that the particular outcome was A and then Alice knows how to update her state to the post measurement state that I've described. But what if Bob doesn't tell Alice the outcome of the measurement or if that record of the outcome gets permanently lost? Well, then Alice has to just consider the convex combination of all the possible output density operators for all the possible measurement outcomes and weight them by the appropriate probabilities, the probabilities for those outcomes. So in the case where Alice doesn't learn the outcome of Bob's measurement, the state evolves in the following way. The initial state rho for Alice's system becomes the new state rho prime. I can think of that as the result of a certain linear map acting on the input. That map is defined as summing over all the possible measurement outcomes, the probability of that outcome times the density operator after the measurement when that outcome occurs. And so what is that? Well, we sum over the um, outcomes, the probability of the particular outcome A, that's just the trace of MA rho MA adjoint. The post measurement state is MA rho MA adjoint. And then we have to divide by the normalization. Well, luckily the trace in the numerator, which came from weighting with the probability cancels out the trace in the denominator, which came from normalizing the post measurement state. So we really do have a linear map. It's linear in row. It's just a sum over A of MA rho MA adjoint, where again, we know that the sum over A of MA adjoint MA is equal to the identity um, because the interaction between uh, Alice's system and Bob's was unitary or because all the measurement outcomes have to have probabilities that sum up to one. So this type of linear map of density operators to density operators of this form is what we call a quantum channel, or sometimes we call it a super operator. Super operator meaning it takes operators, density operators to operators, other density operators. We also call it a trace preserving completely positive map a map of density operators to operators, which preserves the trace. This normalization condition on the MAs ensures that rho prime and rho both have the same trace. And um, why do we call it completely positive? Well, it does take a density operator to a density operator. It takes positive to positive, positive operators to positive operators. Completely positive, though, I'm not going to explain what we mean by completely positive until the, until the next lecture. Now, why do we call it a quantum channel? Well, that is uh, in deference to the traditions of communication theory, where we might think of uh, two parties uh, communicating. Let's say they're Charlie and David. Uh, Charlie prepares some signal state. It's just a classical bit string. Uh, he sends it to David, but over a channel, which is noisy. So the noise in the channel can be described by a probability distribution that's conditional on the input state. In other words, uh, David will receive the output Y if Charlie sent the input X with some conditional probability, the probability of Y given X. And this is sort of the quantum version of that. We can think of a quantum state prepared by Charlie, which is sent to David, but it doesn't arrive intact. Instead, it has interacted in some uh, uncontrollable way with the environment. And we have to trace out the environment, which neither Charlie nor David observe, to describe what arrives um, in uh, in David's laboratory, the output from the channel. So just as we speak of channels in the classical case, we also speak of channels in the quantum case. We can also think of the channel as describing time evolution. We might put a quantum state in a quantum memory, but it's not a perfect memory. So that state, 
that system interacts with the environment. We have to trace out the environment to describe the system since we don't observe the environment and that's described by a quantum channel. So you can see in that setting or in the communication setting, we can think of the quantum channel as describing noise in a quantum system. What happens when the quantum system interacts with the environment as quantum systems inevitably do and we can't control the environment that's described by a quantum channel. Now, the way I envisioned it, or the way I described it to you, we can imagine that the, uh, going back to the Alice-Bob language, that Alice's system interacts with Bob's and becomes entangled with it, and then Bob does a measurement, but he doesn't tell Alice the outcome of the measurement. So that's just really a way of describing doing the partial trace over Bob's system. I can do the partial trace in any basis I want, so, I can imagine that Bob does the measurement and then throws away the outcome. That's just a way of describing taking the partial trace in a particular basis. So what we found is called the operator sum representation of a quantum channel. Why is it called operator sum? Because we have a sum, which we interpreted as a sum over measurement outcomes by A and for uh, each one of uh, the terms in the sum, an operator MA acts on the state. In the density operator language, then we have MA acting on the ket, MA adjoint acting on the bra in the density operator. It's also called a Krauss representation of a quantum channel. And the MAs are sometimes said to be the Krauss operators. And I emphasize again, the reason we're interested in quantum channels, the reason it's important for us to understand them and know about them is they describe noise and quantum systems. And noise is the formidable enemy of quantum computing. If a quantum system is subject to noise, if we can't control it perfectly, then we will be challenged to do a reliable quantum computation. To fight off the destructive effects of noise, we need to use the idea of quantum error correction. And I'm not going to explain quantum error correction in this uh, fall term. It will be the topic of the winter term when Professor Katayev is teaching, but in the fall term, we will at least set the foundations, pave the way for that later discussion by delving a little bit into the theory of quantum channels. And that's what I want to do in the next lecture to talk about properties of quantum channels and to deepen our understanding of how they work. So that's what we'll be doing next time. This is it for today. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, have fun and uh, study hard. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.